Today I'm getting away from the fumes and noise of the big city, or some of it anyway, and taking a trip down the Chessington branch. Why? Well, because I think it's quite interesting, historically speaking. Most of Britain's railway network was built in the 19th century, and the majority of it was in place by the 1880s. The Chessington branch is rather different. It didn't fully open until 1939. Let's have a look into it. Ironically, the driving force behind the new railway was roads. The 20th century brought the motor car. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, railways had encouraged the development of housing. Cars changed the game. Suddenly you didn't need to live near a station to commute. Consequently, development began to take place along what had once been country roads. To relieve the traffic around Kingston, a new bypass was built, which brought more development. Sleepy Surrey villages became suburbs of London. This had a knock-on effect on transport in the area. The roads couldn't cope with the traffic, and the railways that already existed were badly overcrowded. The Southern Railway, which owned those railways, proposed a solution. A new railway running from Mottsburg Park to Leatherhead. Actually, they already had a line running from Mottsburg Park to Leatherhead, but this was a different one. This would not only increase the number of passengers they could carry, but it would also enable them to serve places not on the network at that time, which would reduce the distance residents would need to drive. The planned stations were Malden Manor, Tolworth, Chessington Court, Chessington Grange, Malden Rushet, and Ashdead. Ashdead already had a station, as indeed it still does, but apparently this one was going to be a different one. The line was proposed in 1929, but work didn't begin until 1936. There was some sort of economic crisis in 1929, you might have heard of it. Unfortunately, that delay would prove fatal. Having plenty of advance notice, the land along the route was bought up by speculators who planned to hold the company to ransom, selling their land to the Southern Railway at a ridiculous price making it an unusual example of a railway whose construction was prevented by its own construction. The Southern could hardly afford to play those sorts of games, but fortunately they received some help. In 1933, the London Passenger Transport Board was formed. You might know it as London Transport. It was, on the face of it, an amalgamation of London's underground lines, trams and buses. But it was also an organisation intended to drastically improve transport in the rapidly growing city, and as a result it had a strong influence over commuter railways. The Leatherhead branch was within their remit. Or at least part of it was, their jurisdiction ended just south of Chessington. So they were able to drop some money on the Southern, but only enough to cover the part of the route that was on their turf. So the Southern settled on building part of their railway for now. Hopefully, the money they would raise from it would pay for the rest in due course. Even though the line had already proved costly, the Southern weren't going to skimp on it. It had to be fully compatible with their main line. Therefore, it was going to be double-tracked throughout and electrified from the start. The Southern were big fans of electrification, which was already clearly where the future lay for commuter lines. Speaking of the future, the architecture along the line was to be up to the minute in terms of its design. To match their modern electric trains, the stations along the route would be Art Deco, all concrete and glass. The style they went with was a rather streamlined look. Rail enthusiasts often refer to it as the Odeon style, because its sweeping lines are more reminiscent of a picture palace than a railway station. The Southern, however, called it Marine, Whatever you call it, it gives the stations along this branch a unique look. There was also a practical reason for it, though. Concrete was cheap and low maintenance. Features of the stations included little glass portholes to let light through the canopies by day, fluorescent lighting tubes, and lift shafts, with no lifts in them. These were stations designed for the future, for a time when these suburbs would be buzzing with commuters. Tolworth and Chessington South also possessed goods yards, goods being a substantial part of the railway's traffic in those days. The first section to Tolworth opened in 1938. The section to Chessington Grange opened in 1939. 
At a late stage, it was decided to rename Chessington Court and Chessington Grange to Chessington North and Chessington South. Initially, the line ran with six trains an hour, three in each direction. The Southern were optimistic about its prospects and began work on the rest of the line. But progress was halted by another external factor. With the outbreak of the Second World War, the extension wasn't a priority. In the years after the war, there was no money. And then came legislation. The Southern Railway weren't the only ones paying attention to new developments on the outskirts of London, and there were many who felt that things had gone too far. The result was the Greenbelt, a protected area of land around London upon which development could not take place. Well, not easily, anyway. The 1938 Greenbelt London and Home Counties Act defined what a green belt was, and in 1955 the bounds of the belt were set in place. The line was going no further than Chessington. That being said, thanks to the work already done, the intended course is pretty easy to trace on Google Earth. As a consequence of this truncated construction, while the line was far from unsuccessful, it was never the secondary main line the Southern built it as. Only one of the platforms at Chessington South was ever brought into use, and in 1958 the service was reduced from three trains an hour to two as it remains to this day. While the lines of the concrete are still exciting, cost-cutting measures got rid of much of the glass, replacing it with brick or more concrete, so it often looks oppressive rather than airy. What of today? Well, the branch serves Chessington World of Adventures and it's still a commuter route, but it's far from overloaded. The stations are relatively quiet. Still, it is distinctive, even among the many, many commuter lines of the London suburbs. I don't think it would be fair to say that the line was a complete failure, but it is a curiosity. Hello all, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do click the like button, subscribe for more if that's what you're into, and click the notification bell to be kept up to date on my future videos. As always, I'd like to thank my chums on Ko-fi and Patreon for your generous donations. You are the leather to my head. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio!